Yo, what's going on guys? It is Fox and I here here and welcome back to the F1 debate for you guys today here on the channel. We are back from the summer break and Formula 1 is back in town and it is McLaren that are clear number one uh, in terms of just performance now. It's completely clear on that. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that can argue otherwise. I'm going to get, get into it. If you guys end up enjoying today's video, as per usual, obviously, feel free to drop a like on the video. You can't even see my thumb. There it is. Like. Uh, and also, if you're new around here and you enjoy the content you do see, be sure to subscribe as well. It would go a long, long way for me. So, I have got my notes, which basically is just highlighting what team I need to talk about. Uh, and then I've also got the classification as well. So, if I do start looking down a little bit, it's because I'm just double checking that because uh, I tend to ramble on quite considerably. So, you know, I need to make sure that I stay on track with everything. But first things first, what was the race like? Um, it was okay. It was nothing special, but it was nothing terrible, you know. Um, obviously, Norris uh, put in an outstanding lap to get pole position for the Dutch Grand Prix. Three and a half tenths of a Verstappen. Statement lap from Lando Norris. A champion's lap um, from Lando Norris. And I'll give credit where it's due. I've slated uh, Norris quite a lot. Um, but this weekend was a weekend where he put together everything apart from one thing which we'll obviously go through later on but i've given lando a lot of stick um i do admit to that that's absolutely fine um and i think you know he's gone ahead away from the summer break and he's come back and he's just refreshed himself i think because he had quite a lot of races on the bounce where things were going wrong and when you have those races coming in quick fire succession and it just keeps not working out for you it definitely obviously hurts you um and as much as some people will say like footballers for example i want to get back out there then you know in three days time and play another game and, and and put things right but you know if you then concede early in the next game in in your football match you're all of a sudden nervous again and you're on the back foot so sometimes the best things to do is to go and just take a break uh, you know reset and um he's done that and he put in a great performance with that qualifying Still's got issues with his race starts, though. Um, he is the only... I think he might be the only driver to not actually gain a place off the line so far this season. In the last four races, Landon Norris has n failed to actually gain a place. In fact, he's lost a place um, or more um, during his race starts. And I, he's now... What is it? Seven times he started at the front of the grid. And every single time he has... Well, not led at the end of the first lap. It wasn't obviously catastrophic because the McLaren on that occasion had the quickest car. But ultimately, you can't afford to be doing that constantly week in, week out. He needs to go ahead. Uh, and if there's anything that anybody wants to criticize on Lando Norris, a.k.a. me, um, is just working on those starts. Because the initial getaway was fine. Same reactions to Verstappen. He got a lot of wheel spin, though, especially in second gear. Uh, and that cost him. But... He stuck with Verstappen, the gap didn't get anywhere over two seconds, and you kind of thought at that point, when the gap's not going over two seconds, and it's just sort of ebbing and flowing a little bit, you either got a very close and competitive race, or you've got one driver that's got more pace, and eventually Lando started to close that gap in, then he got himself in the DRS range, had one go, and it didn't work. The next time around, then he breezed past Verstappen on lap 18 and then went ahead and claimed the biggest uh, race victory margin of the entire season. I believe it was 22.4 seconds for Verstappen in Bahrain, 22.8 seconds for Landon Norris here in uh, the uh, Dutch Grand Prix in Zandvoort. This was also a different type of statement win as well, I feel, because not only was Norris able to dominate and get pole, uh, get the fastest lap as well on the last lap, that gave me... Um, uh, Silverstone 2019 vibes when Hamilton did that on his hard tyres. Um, but it also put away any doubt of Lando Norris being lucky in Formula 1. He obviously, he had his one race win in Miami when McLaren brought in upgrades. And funnily enough, McLaren brought in big upgrades this weekend and it worked for him. Um, but obviously, when you only win via a safety car getting you in that position, sure, don't get me wrong, you've earned your right to be in that position because you took the strategy and the strategy worked in your favour. But this is a type of race where no matter what anybody did, no one stopped you. And that's, <clears throat> and that's kind of a critical thing there. Like, he, in the first thing, he can cover off Verstappen X, Y, and Z. I'd um, you know, he covered him off with that pit stop and he just kept building and building and building the gap and it was basically like yeah we'll box to cover max but even if we box to cover max we don't mind 
if Verstappen pits earlier because he's not going to come out in front of us anyway. So it, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. And obviously, he was able to win. Uh, on the flip side, though, it was not a good race for Piastri. He did qualify well, qualified third, I believe it was. But he lost out at the start. And then McLaren put him on a very heavy tyre offset to basically come back at Charles Leclerc and Russell and then potentially try and get Max Verstappen. Overall, it kind of worked uh, in terms of getting past George Russell. But for some reason, I was quite, I was really shocked um, at uh, Piastri not being able to pass Charles Leclerc. The Ferrari is obviously quicker in a straight line. The McLaren was obviously draggier. But it didn't quite make sense to me that the tyre offset meant so much. Obviously, Piastri was saying that getting to, to catch Charles Leclerc he basically overheated his tyres and so forth. And I think that's just a bit of driver error because there's such a long way to go in the Grand Prix. He doesn't need to rush to the back of Charles Leclerc. He could have just taken it gentle and then slowly eased his way in. Because obviously at that point, you know, Leclerc was never able to pull more than, than a second and a half from Piastri for the rest of the race. And obviously, you know, he had the quicker car. And I think Leclerc, if I check the race classification, he only finished very, uh, not that far behind Verstappen in the end, yeah. So Verstappen finished 22.8 seconds uh, off the race win. Charles Leclerc was 25.4 seconds off the race win. So there was less than three seconds, oh, there's 3.2 seconds between Charles Leclerc and, not even 3.2, it's going to be less now, it'll be 2.6, something like that. Yeah, 2.6 seconds between Verstappen and Leclerc, which kind of shows that not only did Charles Leclerc have some outstanding pace in that Ferrari. But it showed that if Piastri was just a bit more gentle with the way that he was coming at Leclerc, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe Piastri just simply did not have the pace in that race to do anything. I mean, Leclerc kept up with Piastri for a lot of the first stint. So it kind of gave me the question of, does Piastri not, is, is he just not working well with the car? Um, but he did a great job. And ultimately, Leclerc also did an amazing job. And I feel like if Piastri took his time maybe a bit more, he easily could have got a 1-2 for McLaren. It was definitely on the cards for them today, um, and they kind of just wasn't able to do that. I don't know why I'm saying today. I'm recording this the day after the Grand Prix, so it's not really today, is it? It's, it's a Monday, so it's not, it's, not, it's, not even, it's not even the right day, but nevertheless. Um, Red Bull, though, um, this is a worrying time now for Red Bull. The gap in the championship is now 30 points. There are nine races to go. They are no longer fastest, uh, the fastest car on the grid. You know, I think overall, if they can get the car in the ultimate sweet spot, and it's such a narrow window, but if they absolutely nail that car into its working window, I think they've got more performance than McLaren. But in terms of just an all-round all range of car, the McLaren is the best car on the grid now. There is no denying that. And I think... Teams now are basically going to be crapping themselves every time McLaren released the upgrade document on a Thursday. Because every time they do that, especially like they did in Miami and here, they win. And they take even bigger steps forwards. And we're now into a brand new era of Formula 1. And I, you know, it was it's weird that we're admitting that now. I would have expected that maybe, I would have expected it in 2026, I'll be honest with you. But we are now in an era where you are going to see McLaren consistently winning races um there's no doubt about it anymore that car is by far the quickest car out there it works so so well on any type of track any type of condition and especially around Zandvoort when it was extremely blustery the car was just so stable compared to the Red Bull who had horrific understeer the Ferrari had some oversteer especially on the exit of turn 10 I think it is um, the Mercedes was also suffering from oversteer. So the car is the outright fastest. And we are, like I said, we're in a new era now. This is the era of, McLa of McLaren dominance. And can they go ahead and win the Constructors' Championship? Yes, I've said that for a long, long time. I think they will win the Constructors. And nine races and the gap's 30 points. It's evidential. I don't think that they will do... Um, I think it'll take them probably to like Singapore to get in front of Red Bull and the Constructors. But I think they'll win it. I don't have a doubt about that in my mind. Um, can Ferrari overtake Red Bull and the Constructors? Now remember, this is the interesting thing. The Constructors battle is actually still on for Ferrari. In terms of not winning it. I don't think they're going to win it. But if I go and find the Constructors Championship on here. I'm pretty sure. Here we go, right? So Red Bull are on 434 points, right? McLaren are on 404 
Ferrari are on 370. Now, if you think of how far Ferrari have slipped back from, you know, where they've been post-Monaco, to be only 64 points behind Red Bull with nine races to go, Ferrari are due to bring major upgrades to the Italian Grand Prix. They always do it, obviously, because they want to impress in front of their Tifosi home crowd. A lot of that is going to be, obviously, surf circuit specification, like the rear wing and probably, you know, changes to the front wing, beam wing, beam wing etc. But they've obviously got some major upgrades coming to the next couple of races in Monza, Baku, and Singapore to counter the porpoising problems that they've been suffering since they brought in the Barcelona and the Imola upgrade packages. If they can get those right and it works for them and the drivers regain the confidence in the car and they can push more and it gives them a better working window, nine races to close a 64-point gap is way, way possible. I don't know why I was saying way, way possible. It's highly possible for Ferrari to also overtake Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship. But because I've been saying that McLaren will overtake for, uh, Red Bull and win the Constructors' Championship for months now, I'll put it to the test. I don't think Red Bull will get second either. I think Ferrari will do them. There you go. I've said it. I've said it loud and proud. Ferrari will beat Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship this year. No, I am. I know I'm wearing Mercedes gear because I'm a Mercedes fan. No, I'm not going to put Mercedes as a Constructors' Championship challenger because they're on 200. They're what 94, 94 points behind Ferrari. So what's that? 100 and yeah, they're way over 130 odd points ahead behind Red Bull, and they're not taking 10 points a race out of Red Bull. So uh, you know for the rest of the season. So. No, I'm not saying Mercedes will beat Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship. My Constructors' Championship order will be McLaren, Ferrari, Red Bull, Mercedes. That's my order, okay? And I'm being quite bold and silly about it. But regardless, you know, it is what it is. Um, shout out to uh, Carlos Sainz. Obviously, it was a great race from him. Started in P10. Uh, looked way off the pace for all of qualifying, but in race trim, just got his head down. Got the overtakes done early. Just managed his own pace. Then got close to Leclerc and Piastri at the end. Had some great pace, especially when he cleared Russell, or when Russell basically pitted. Had some really good pace, actually, and, you know, credit to him. His race pace was really, really good. It was quite impressive. Um, Red Bull, I mean, I very briefly touched on them, but what I didn't actually realise until I was um, watching uh, the race's YouTube video after the race um, was that Verstappen was actually running with a floor specification that they ran back in Bahrain, and this was a worrying thing, because I've got it on my notes here for Red Bull experimenting. It's now at the point where Red Bull are having to go down the experimental pathway because they clearly do not know where to go with the RB20. Now, there's probably going to be uh, a di there's going to be different ways to improve performances of these cars. And a lot of it now is more mechanical than it is um, sort of aero and chassis. So that's why the cars are mostly looking the same now and there's not really been significant changes. I know for the, you know, the likes of Williams, uh, for example, you know, Williams, they brought major upgrades and changed their side pod inlets so it had the overbite. Um, but realistically, there's not really many teams anymore now that are making these sort of big visual upgrades. That's what I'm looking for. It's more so a mechanical platform now. And for Red Bull to be going back to floor specs that they ran back at the first race of the season in March or late February, it'd be March, is bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. I'm pretty sure they said that they concluded that the the, the stuff that Verstappen was running was around about two to three tenths per lap. Slow, or It was either per lap or just in general slower than what Perez was running, which makes me even more worried for Perez because Perez finished in P6, I want to say, yes. But he finished, what, 30-odd seconds? In fact, I'll get it now because I am, you know, scrolling through everything on the notes here. He finished over, I swear, it was over like 30 seconds behind Verstappen. So Perez finishes 39 seconds off the race win. Verstappen finished 22 seconds off the race win. So Perez finished 17 seconds behind Verstappen with a car that overall, in terms of the data that Red Bull picked up, was, let's say it's per lap, two tenths per lap faster than what Verstappen was running. And yet Perez finished 17 seconds off max. And he had basically a quicker car than what Max was running. That's where I just find Perez to just not be very reliable. And, well, you know, it depends on what they want to do moving forward, if they want to keep Perez or not. But that's a different topic for a different time. Uh, next up then, Mercedes-Benz. 
Um, yeah, that was a shocker from Mercedes. But should I just like not? Should I just stop wearing this? No, I'm only joking. Um, for a team that won obviously three of the last four races coming into this Dutch Grand Prix to come home P7 and P8, basically reminiscent of what they were doing at the very start of the year when they were the clear four fastest team, was a very big disappointment. Lewis Hamilton on the one side actually had a great, basically, the two Mercedes is flipped. So Russell had a great quali, Hamilton had a shit quali. Russell had a shit race, Hamilton had an amazing race. That's basically how it kind of pans out. And I think questions need to be asked about Mercedes's upgrade package because at the, at the Belgian Grand Prix, they suffered with porpoising and they took that off. Eventually, they said that it was due to the mechanical um, setup of the car that wasn't working. So they ended up changing it. Uh, but because of the wet weather, they took the new floor off and then ran with the old floor. Uh, and it obviously, they then swapped to these, uh, to not only did they swap to put the old package back onto the Mercedes, but in terms of the mechanical setup, they set the car up the exact same as they did in Silverstone, and they meant end up being the fastest car. Now, there could be two things that could be a, a hindrance for Mercedes here. The first one is obviously, it's actually probably three. The first one, obviously, is going to be the upgrade. Is the upgrade actually working? Now, I'm pretty sure Toto Wolfs did say after the race that they need to go ahead and look at this upgrade package and see what it's doing because apparently there was something that it was meant to do that it's not doing um and you know that is something that's going to be worrying for the team but on the other side if they go back to the older floor i mean as you saw when they went to the older floor and the um silverstone setup in bar in belgium they became the quickest team and nobody could beat them i think it's clear that mercedes are not good in slow to medium speed corners but when it comes to tracks that are high speed um and high speed cornering that's where Mercedes seem to be pretty good at and seem to excel well at. So a track like Monza, for an example, would probably... It's going to suit Mercedes more than it will Zandvoort, um, for an example. Because while Monza is a completely unique circuit in terms of, you know, just how quick it is, it's a lot of high-speed corners. Obviously, there are some tight chicanes, the first chicane and the varianti alta i think unless i'm completely wrong in that i could be completely wrong i probably am but then you've got the two lesmos which are high speed corners the ascara chicane which is high speed the parabolica which is just pure high speed that's i think where mercedes do excel and i think that's why i feel feel that they'll be back up there again of course as well they're not the quickest car on a straight line mercedes but they seem to be be being able to dial in some more top end speed I don't think they'll be as good as like Red Bull and McLaren. I don't, I'm not saying that Mercedes are going to go back and win races again. But what I'm saying is I think Mercedes will treat Zandvoort as a little bit of an outlier. They've never really been brilliant around Zandvoort. I mean, they were quick in 2021, but ultimately Verstappen was faster in that Red Bull at the time because of especially the banking of turn three, he was able to gain like two tenths on the Mercs there. In 22, they were quick again, but they couldn't really exploit that because of the qualifying um, woe. Uh, when Vettel, I think, went off or Perez went off. In 23, again, there was a bit of issues with um, qualifying there. But it's just not really been an amazing circuit for them. The other thing could well be that, obviously, it was very, very windy. Maybe it's just Mercedes weren't able to work with the weather conditions. Uh, and the last one, and this is why I'm sort of going in this order, because it becomes a bit more generic for everyone. And I think the thing is, is with the Mercedes package, and it's could probably it's going to be the same with Red Bull as well. I think with McLaren, it's quite clear that even with limited data, McLaren can set their car up to be perfect. With Mercedes, on the other hand, they obviously had a decent car on the Friday. They said they had too much understeer in the car, so they then dialed it out, but they did too much dialing out. And the problem is, I think with Mercedes, I think they need, uh, in order to get their car in a position to compete, they need every single second of running possible to keep building up the information and that's probably going to be the same with red bull and also with ferrari as well the fact that fp1 was wet and then it eventually became dry with like two minutes to go doesn't really give you amazing information and obviously russell ran with the new floor hamilton ran with the old floor come fp2 then they get a fully relevant session where they were quick in terms of their quality simulation runs because i think russell was fastest and hamilton was fourth Long runs then, they weren't brilliant. But then they knew, we've got too much understeer, we're going to dial that out, drop a bit of quality performance, but that's going to give us better performance in the race and basically do heavy fine tuning. But then when FP3 is not only wet, but they lose basically all of it, 
in fact, Lewis Hamilton, for example, didn't even set a lap in FP3. You've got no relative data to go, right, we've done all of this setup change work. What have we done right? And what do we need to quickly adjust going into qualifying? And with the Mercedes, I think they needed that. And maybe that's why they couldn't get the upgrade package to work because frankly, just like the Belgian Grand Prix, they didn't get any dry running to, to help them with that. And like I was saying, with McLaren, they can just go out there with a base setup and go bang, and we're quickest. Whereas everybody else has to do the heavy fine tuning to get on their level or, you know, as close as they can. So I think McLaren on that front is what made them so quick this weekend. I could be completely wrong. I could be making it up. Maybe Mercedes will go into the Italian Grand Prix and remove the new floor again and put the old one back on and then fine tune that car even more and maybe uh, you know ditch that upgrade and it's just a failed one maybe i'm um, you know anything can happen uh, in that front so we'll just have to wait and see uh looking at the rest of the grid though um i wanted to give a shout out here in my notes to pierre gasly i thought he had an outstanding race weekend um he was quick in all of the qualifying simulations that were being done um he was quick i think he got through into q3 as well started quite high up the order again it was a little bit of an outlier because obviously there was the likes of perez uh, no, Perez was in front of Gasly. There's the likes of Sainz and Hamilton that were behind Gasly. So, obviously, they eventually they got in front. But realistically, Gasly, I'm pretty sure, finished in P9, I want to say. And the only person that would have been in front... No, yeah, he did. So, he finished in P9. So, Gasly finished best of the rest of the top four teams, which I thought was a super impressive drive from Pierre Gasly. He kept his head down. He didn't really fight too hard. He put a good battle in with Carlos Sainz. He put a good battle in with Hamilton. He went long on his stint, got onto the hard tyres, and just drove a great race. And if I look at the gap between himself... Oh, okay, they, they finished a lap down. I can't even look at the gaps. But he managed to beat, you know, the Aston Martins, the Haas, the, uh, the RBs, and obviously the Williams as well. So, you know, it was a perfect weekend for Gasly, all things considered, in terms of what he can do. Uh, ultimately, this is yet another race in a row now where... The top four teams, all of them have got themselves into the points, meaning that there's only two points paying positions left on, on up for grabs. And Gasly gets two of them, you know, gets the highest of them. So I just want to give a massive shout out to Gasly. I thought he had a great race uh, and definitely deserved a little bit of praise. Um, still pretty much RB, Haas and Aston are all pretty much together. Um, Alonso picking himself up a points. He actually admitted that they have the seventh fastest car now, which is a massive downfall from where they were, not only at the start of 2023, but at the start of 2024, because at the start of 24, they were in the mix with McLaren, Ferrari, and Mercedes. Should I say, in the mix with McLaren and Ferrari, kinda, and definitely ahead of Mercedes. But to come away now and basically be, well, Alonso got P10, Stroll, unfortunately, got P13, so didn't score any points. It's just a massive, massive downgrade for them, and I just... It's puzzling to see why. Um, obviously, Aston have got a very bold um, car concept. It's very, it's quite similar to, to last year in some aspects. I genuinely did personally believe that Aston would make changes to the side pod inlet because it is a very, it's still, they're still using the underbite um, sort of inlet, but it's a, such a thin underbite, very much like Red Bull's letterbox underbite. Um, but realistically, if they're going to go down that route, I personally, obviously they're not going to, maybe they will for 2025, but I personally thought with how thin that they're using their letterbox and it's, I don't know, it's just a weird shape because it sort of lips upwards still. I just, I don't know if the airflow would really like that, but I thought that they would eventually transfer to a basically a letterbox overbite, um, side pod inlet, but obviously they're not. Um, but yeah, it's just weird to see their upgrades just going downhill and just not really working. I just personally thought that they would actually get it together but to be in the mix with Haas, RB, Williams and Alpine is quite poor from them and yeah Alonso definitely has some cause for concerns but ultimately he gets a point and that's kind of all you can do when there's two points paying positions up for grabs and the rest of the top uh, four teams are constantly scoring you've just got to get what you can get and every point matters so Alonso can take that one Hulkenberg P11, Ricardo a decent race in P12, Stroll 13th uh, Albon 14th, and Ocon 15th with Sargent in 16th. Sonoda with a bad race, actually, in 17th. Same with Magnussen. That was actually quite a cool five-car fight between Magnussen, what was it, Magnussen, Albon, the two uh, Alf, uh, Aston Martins, and Gasly, I think it was, in there as well. That was quite a funny fight. I actually quite enjoyed that battle between all of them. That was cool. They were all coming from the banking, uh, Albon around the outside, and then they're all just breezing. If I was Magnussen, I'd be, f I'd be pissed. I'd just be there like... All right. 
the fuck, man? What? <laughs> like, yeah, I just, I'd be pissed. But I'm pretty sure he was, like, trying to slow down everybody else to keep Hulkenberg ahead. But that didn't really work because ultimately they got passed in the end. And the two Saubers, uh, yeah, the two Saubers are the slowest cars on the grid. They were poor. Bottas beat show. Um, I did want to take a minute, though, uh, when I was just reading the rest of this grid order to talk about Williams. Um, obviously, they were the second team now in two races to be disqualified um, for uh, failing um, Park Ferme. Um, Williams brought a big upgrade package to the Dutch Grand Prix. I believe it was a new floor, new side pod inlet. They obviously went to the overbite system that, every, that Ferrari has adopted, that McLaren and Red Bull adopted at the start of the year. Um, they also brought a new floor as well. And while they did all of their measurements on the floor, um, they made it too wide by like three millimeters or something like that. How you mess up the measurements on the floor, I don't know. But then I guess at the same time, how would you mess up being 1.5 kilograms underweight after a race? I don't know. So that, you know, it, it kind of works in circles like that. We, we always look at it and go, it's just such a simple thing. And realistically, obviously it's not. So yeah, very puzzling to see that. But it did confirm that Williams's upgrades definitely worked, especially in the hands of Albon. And, um, you know, his qualifying result, albeit with an illegal flaw, was highly impressive getting through to Q3, out-qualifying Sainz and Hamilton. And his race pace, to start from the back of the grid um, and to finish in P14, is a very decent re return, considering I'm pretty sure he pitted extremely early in that race as well to get onto the hard tyres. So he was basically on a heavy tyre offset but he made it work. And I'm pretty sure he too stopped as well. So you've got to give credit where it's due. I think the Williams upgrade package has worked really, really well. The biggest problem that they've got is they have a guy in their car called Logan Sargent, who I'm going to now make my brief criticism about. The guy should never have had a second season in Formula One. The guy's wasting Williams' time, efforts and money and they need to drop him. Um, I obviously have seen the reports that James Vowles and Williams are, have lost patience and are trying to loan in somebody else for the rest of the season. Um, the two candidates that seem to be on the list is Mick Schumacher and Liam Lawson. If I was James Vowles, I'd probably look to get in probably Liam Lawson. Um, I think it'd be good for Red Bull really to get him some racing uh, information and some knowledge. I think putting Mick Schumacher in the car, I don't think is the best choice. More so because when he was driving for Haas, let's not forget that he literally ripped the car in half like three times. So I don't really think Mick is the right option for that. I know Toto Wolff is saying that Mick should really definitely get an opportunity in that car. Obviously, Toto and James have got a great relationship from obviously working together at Mercedes. And obviously, Williams is not, it's not a partner team for Mercedes, but it's the closest customer team that Mercedes basically has obviously you know they're never going to loan anyone to mclaren because mclaren are a works team with a they don't, i know they're a customer team but you know they're a main branded team and are basically championship challengers aston martin have got too much money to basically go we don't want to take away Lance stroll or fernando alonso so williams being that midfield back market team is always going to be mercedes's closest little buddies to do a bit of loan deals in there so obviously he'd be trying to push for that um, but I think Liam Lawson should go in that car, and I genuinely do believe that Logan should not be in that car at the Italian Grand Prix for the rest of the season. I think Williams have to be brutal. He's been so poor. He cannot out-qualify Albon. He can't get that car into the points. He's costing them too much time. He's costing them way too much money with these crashes that he keeps going into. He's way too slow, and he's literally another Mazepin. He's another Latifi. He's another... Well, we've, any real... Stroll, I'm not, I'm only taking the mick, all right, Stroll's bad, but you know, you know, he's another one of those where he's just, he's got himself into Formula One, and don't get me wrong, I respect Williams highly for giving Logan Sargent the chance in Formula One, when it came to Logan Sargent being a contender for a Formula One seat, he was in the Williams Junior Driver Program, he was doing well in F2, and Williams said, we want to bring somebody from our academy into Formula One, and we're going to make sure that Logan Sargent gets that chance. They gave, this is what makes it more frustrating for Williams, they gave Logan Sargent everything in terms of support to get him into that car, and then they gave him the support to go, look, your rookie season was bad, but we go again, and we'll try another season, and let's see if you can do anything better. And it's not worked out. And it's just, it's painful. It really is. Because again, I respect Williams so much for allowing them to use 
their junior driver program and make it mean something. Because for those junior drivers, they'll look at that and go, what's the point in being a part of you when you never bring anyone into your seat? So to go, he doesn't have enough super license points, but if you do this and you get the super license points, you're in Formula One. Imagine the amount of support you would feel, you know, as a driver to go, Williams really wanted me and they gave me everything and told me if I do this and I'm going to do this, I get into Formula One and then you do it and they go, bang, there's your contract, you're in. And then you just rubbish, basically. And then to go, right, well, you know, a lot of people have been saying you shouldn't be in Formula One for another season for us, but it's your rookie season, we'll go again. And then you're just as useless as ever. Yeah, I think he needs to uh, get himself out of that car. I think Williams needs to be brutal. I don't think it'll happen at the Italian Grand Prix from looking at it as a Williams perspective. I think it's too quick of a turnaround. But I personally think he should not be in that car at the Italian Grand Prix. I think after the Italian Grand Prix, they'll remove him. Um, and uh, speaking of the Italian Grand Prix, good little segue there. What do I think is going to happen at the Italian Grand Prix? Well, first things first, obviously it's Ferrari's home race. They always do well. Uh, at Monza, they always put every every heart and soul and tear and sweat and blood into that race weekend. I think they'll be quick. I think they will be quick. I think they'll have uh, a lot of circuit specification pieces to go onto that card to make them quick. I think Red Bull will be uh, stronger than they were in Zandvoort. I believe, obviously, Red Bull's got fantastic aero efficiency. We've seen that in 22 and 23. They've not been able to qualify on pole, but they've been able to race beautifully um, and carry a little bit more wing on the car to be quicker in the sector two to give them more performance and ultimately better tire wear. McLaren, obviously, for me, are now the clear favourites going into the weekend. They do have a draggy car, so if they can try and limit the drag, because last season at the Italian Grand Prix was McLaren's worst race weekend, I think, you know, post the Austria upgrade. That's when they really fell back and really couldn't do anything. Mercedes, I think they'll be better than they were in Zandvoort. The big question mark for them is, is the upgrade package working? And have they managed to find out what they did wrong? I personally think it was setup related, but you never know. Um, and obviously, we will go from there. But obviously, the Formula 1 Championship is getting closer. Red Bull are getting more and more worried. I do believe that they've lost the Constructors' Championship, even though they're winning it. Um, the Drivers' Championship, 70 points, nine races to go it's still on it definitely is i don't think norris will take the title but hey if he does it'll be one of the most shocking titles uh, for a long long time but if you have enjoyed this episode of the f1 debate as i said at the start obviously feel free to drop it a like you can actually see my thumbs this time subscribe to the channel if you are new around here as well and obviously as i always say with the f1 debate videos this is obviously open for debate so put your comments in the comment section down below what you thought of the race and anything you want to just well, voice your opinions over, really. Uh, and I will see you guys for the next one after the Italian Grand Prix. Take care, all. Peace.